Leeds, Leeds, Leeds. What is happening? Hello and welcome to episode 2 of the Working Hours podcast. Again, I'm not going to say too much at the beginning of this episode. This is a conversation uh, with someone else, so this is the first anonymous episode. Um, so a bit of an experiment on that front. And uh, yes, I imagine a few of these will be anonymous episodes. Some of them will be named episodes. It really depends on the content and who I'm speaking to. So I'm trying to keep these anonymous in some cases. I mean, obviously that's difficult these days, but just to kind of protect people at a basic level. So anyway, you may hear some uh, occasions where the sound sort of drops out. Um, it's not a fault with your player or anything like that it's just me cutting out bits of information anyway hope you enjoyed the show and i will be back at the end again right okay yeah. we'll make a start then okay so, all the way around there. have you any idea what the hell i'm gonna do no what, what the hell this is no, no, no one does no I do tell people and then instantly forget. Yeah, so um, but I thought the best way to do it was to not prepare. I've I've got a habit of preparing for things if I know about them. Yeah. So it's better to not or something, I think. Yeah, well, I've, yeah. I want to use the... I mean, I, I don't know if I should be using a set bunch of questions or anything for these yet. So yeah. um, I'm basically practicing at the moment and just yeah. listening to what comes out and seeing sort of... I think my theory is try and find what's interesting, see if there's a regular thing that people talk about, but yeah. I might just have to start putting some questions together and make it a bit more ordered. But I'm going to see how these go. So I've got uh, like about three or four hours of recordings now to work through. So um, I haven't got the book here, so I can't show you the book. Okay. But it's based on this book that I mentioned to you before um, uh, by a guy called... Studs Terkel, I always get his name wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he just interviewed a bunch of people and asked them what they did and just to talk about work, how they felt about it, what, what they were doing, just their general opinions on it. Yeah. So they're all together as sort of anecdotal stories. So I'm guessing he, you know, I mean, he was a, he was a journalist. So I would imagine they were interviews that he kind of whittled down and sort of edited into a narrative rather than just a straightforward, this is what this person said or wrote or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I, I just want to get people talking about work mm-hmm. um, and not just sort of the day-to-day, yeah. of like nine to five or whatever, but also outside of work, other stuff that you do, um, you know, extracurricular activities can be work, especially in a, you know, like if you have to golf for your job or something like that. I mean, that's part I of golf. your work, isn't it? I golf. <laughs> uh, so, um, what are you currently doing for work then? Okay, so I I am in what you might call like a portfolio worker in a way. In the in as much as I've got, I've moved from like a f- totally freelance life. Um, to one that has a few employers in inverted commas um, and I've not traditionally been very comfortable working under an employer mm. but I now have three employers um, but work for me is like the majority of it is working as a tutor mm-hmm. but on a zero hours contract essentially right um, and that is do you want me to talk a bit about that one or just tell you the whole project yeah you can do I mean mm. At the moment, my plan with these recordings um, is that I'm I'm not going to publish anything yeah. yet, and I'm not going to publish anything without running it by people first of what what they've said, because like not only sort of protecting people's information, but also protecting employers potentially and so on. So yeah. I don't know, you know, if I have to blank stuff out. I mean, feel like you can talk freely, but we can always take stuff yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, no, I will. I will. And, yeah, I will totally. So, um, so the yeah the job is a um is running a course called right. and now the goal is traditionally it's a conservatoire and it's like very old fashioned i mean mm-hmm. it says it in the name and it's like it has it's thrived on this idea of excellence and a kind of elitist form of excellence in very specific things be it like m- musical instrument playing or acting mm. um and it has essentially survived on a, 
on a name and reputation without a huge amount of scrutiny into its methods. Um, and a lot of, I mean, a lot of who's who of acting, like Hollywood actors, English ones, mm. you know, you can trace back, a lot of them have gone through that sort of system. Mm. And then, but this course is different in that it is, um, it's meant to be for cross arts practitioners. Um, and headphones stop working. Cross arts practitioners. Oh no. I think it's my headphone. It's my headphones. Not not any problem here. Um, so the people that are on this this course are they're not specialists. They are um, generally self taught. Mm -hmm. They're generally not the sort of person that you would see in a conservatoire. Um, they're from sort of harder to reach backgrounds. To use some like pretty um, bland terminology. They're, they're, but they're, they're just interesting people who've got a fire and have like learned how to do stuff for themselves. Mm. So I've been t t tutoring on a course that's essentially trying to give people um, the confidence and the tools to like develop their thing and take it to a like a marketplace or a, take it to a just develop it. Yeah. But it's 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 quite confused as a philosophy. Um, there's there's a, there's a lot of problems involved with like having a course like that at a conservatoire. Um, Do, I mean, are you working from a sort of pre-existing syllabus that's arranged? Aren't you putting this together yourself? Well, it's a bit of both. So there's been a kind of some people have sat in a room and they've made it like a very a kind of idealistic version of what they want the course to do, and they want they also while pulling people from hard to reach backgrounds, they also want people to impact hard you know like hard to reach communities. Mm. Um, so this idea of social engagement is right at the core of it. Mm. And so there's, there's sort of an unrealistic expectation where people people will come in and make sense of what their thing is, their skills. Mm. They will package it in a way that they can then kind of transmit it back out to a public, like to a community. Mm -hmm. um, and so on paper, it all sounds wonderful. You know, like come in, learn about collaborative practice, learn about setting up projects in communities, mm -hmm learn about um different types of stakeholders and what your responsibilities are as an artist and mm -hmm. like lots of big stuff but these kids i mean people that are on the course can be 18 years old mm -hmm. or they might be 30 there's a kind of that's where the clash is happening where um there the ha there's a sort of there isn't really the language to 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 um assess and validate what, what people are doing it's kind of it's crying out for a more flexible kind of case by case basis almost like a one-to-one -one mentoring kind of thing so what is this in terms of uh, the marketing frameworks for it then? yeah for it to be valid in a kind of set like a higher education yeah. setting it needs to hit certain points and it's it's currently called a degree it's a degree mm -hmm. and it therefore needs to hit certain types of learning yeah but the people that are on it are not necessarily suited to that type of learning or they have such excellence in their craft mm. that they've kind of they've got to this position um and are having to learn like a language to somehow describe the thing they're doing rather than actually developing the thing they're doing so um, are they are they because I, the way that I would imagine it, um, having done some theatre style courses myself, so um, I would imagine there to be quite a performative element to it in some case of like putting together some sort of show that you would have to present, which you would get like, you know, because the, I don't know, but the way that I imagine dance degrees and music degrees and so on, part of it's the playing it's not just the knowing and the the writing you have to do that to some degree because there's a degree mm. but um the way that i see it mostly happening is that people have to put together a piece of work that's assessed do they not are they not doing that yeah or? you see that that's it though but you you're immediately these are some of the problems of the, the that the course is facing but yes that, that is the it should be practice based in as much as it is people people are creating new works mm. Um, and showing them hitting a, an audience or at least early iterations of them and how they might hit an audience. Mm -hmm. So in its purest sense, that's what's going on. That's mm -hmm. good. That's the good work. There's, also, there, there's, there's quite a lot of pressure on that from a model that says, but people have to all understand what their learning outcomes are and they all have to hit the same standards to get the same type of 
grading mm -hmm. and everybody has to know exactly what they're being assessed on mm -hmm. before embarking on it and those two worlds are kind of grating each other in this particular setting mm. um so and also people turning up on the course all have very different um practices so you've got like a stand-up comic mm. uh, who's also a technologist and is interested in making computer games sitting next to someone who's a dance artist sitting next to someone who's a like a a, a singer songwriter next to an actor next to a dramaturg you know it's like all these different so to try and make a a formula it's for like all... a tv green room yeah it is it <laughs> here's is. our various guests for the show it is and that's yeah. why it's so interesting like yeah. you get people like that in a room with with a flexible intelligent brief and it's it's brilliant and mm. people really go somewhere interesting but if you try and ask all of those people to hit academic standards mm. and it's not natural to any of them it get the frustration starts to kind of boil a bit um, but to to answer your question, that they're they're, they're def like, and it is in line with your theatre training, your theatre kind of experience. Mm. There's there is an element of it which is really just like how do you research and develop something to perform? Mm. That's really exciting. Or um, to even know like a bit of the history of where it comes from, or yeah. the the different uh, artistic grammars or language or techniques that uh, that sort of learning. So see, in my head, that's the way that I think of it is that you you would look at that, you write something about that, but your main weighted piece is on your chosen discipline of like, this is what I do. You mm. know? Yeah. And um, and in an ideal world, if me and you and some other intelligent people were designing it from the beginning, that's what it would be built around. But there are other factors that have slightly kind of mm. confused it. But one of them being this idea of social engagement. It's like... To be socially engaged, really, what you need to be able to do, like sort of Pablo Helguera was very good at talking about this, this kind of idea where you, you just you you have to have a conversation with a with an audience, with the real or imagined. Mm. You have to have that that you have to interrogate what it is that you're trying to develop, mm. and not in a way that says I'm bringing this to you. But you know, it's a it's a careful balance. Isn't it's it? sort of like it can't be art without an audience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've forgotten. I've forgotten where that sentence started. Um, so you, we were talking about um, getting to the towards performing something, uh, but there's not necessarily an audience there. Is that where you were going with it? That they have to perform to nothing sometimes. Yeah, or? it's. Um, I can't remember. We'll listen back to it. A little bit. But the uh, <laughs> the um, the that is key to the key to the, the the course really is is kind of building up this sense of not just performing to your own notion of what an artist is oh that's it social engagement so yeah. social engagement essentially can be really just taking something out to an audience whether that's an audience of two or thousands mm -hmm. um and unfortunately the course in its kind of rush to tick boxes has kind of has almost kind of constructed these arenas that social engagement should happen like you should be able to take your thing to a school yeah. or a prison yeah or a, you know what i mean and then and in a way that's got in the so that there is learning to be had in taking what you do to those places but i think what you really want is some space to like say actually this is what i'm developing it and it's for this type this this purpose okay and but to, how much yeah. of that social engagement is really sort of I mean, because it sounds to me a bit like entrepreneurialism, for want of a better word, of, of sort of like, you're going to have to be your own business and you have to get out there and you have to make money wherever you can. But it's a social good. Is yeah. that is that the general thrust of it? Um, there is definitely, I mean, the course was, the title of the course has been a bone of contention, but it's um, <laughs> there's certainly oh, yeah, that element. Yeah that kind of almost like kind of Thatcherist, like young British artist sort of idea of of making your own business, your own rules, mm -hmm. your own audience, your own. And then um, it's funny how things, trends come in and out and the seams sort of affect the thinking around something like this. Um, because, yeah, ultimately, yeah, and the enterprise really is the ability to make something happen 
I do think that's it's a it? good thing. You yeah. know, like it, it's it's all well and good to be taught something and to learn something. Um, you know, whether that's plumbing, carpentry, you know, dance, computer game design. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's like, oh, it's great. So I've got all this theory, I've got all this history, and I've got all this critique about whatever subjects, but you know, does it get me a job? You know, can I can I t- start a business with it? Can mm. I, you know, you do need a certain amount of that as well. Whether you're setting up for yourself or whether you're looking for, to work for someone else, mm. you you do need the business side, the money making side. Yeah, and that's that's interesting in that prior to teaching, I was sort of learning the end that that side of things, mm. the business and the kind of protecting a position or interests or kind of even just basic brand, things. Yeah. Yeah. Or kind of asset uh, assets like or just understanding what I had and what I had to do to monetize it. A lot of learning like that happened when things blew up, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um and it's hard I mean it's really important that you have some fundamentals. But also if someone had sat me in a room when I was even when I was twenty five and said this is how you deal with a licensing agreement I'd have switched off. I'd have, I couldn't have engaged with it without actually having the real situation. But there's there's no relevance to you at that point. It's no. like, well, I'm an artist. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to care about a piece of paper. Mm. No, that's <laughs> it's, right. It's like, okay, well, in order to do this, I now have to care about this piece of paper. So I have to find out what this piece of, piece yeah. of paper is. But you much. I think that's a better way to do it mm. because it's sort of crossing the bridge when you come to it but also um you know if you learn about that piece of paper i mean it's good to have that bit of knowledge in your head mm. but if you spend ages learning on it and you you know it's it's 5 years before you encounter the need for that bit of paper that information is useless to you at that point mm. you know it's been useless to you then for the previous five years, and even when you need it, it's now useless to you because it was too long ago, you've forgotten it. Yeah, and then and that's where kind of like an educational philosophy comes into it. It's like, do you think, like a lot of the people that I've since read about, that the best possible way to learn about something is to take current experience and explore it? Mm. Or do you think the best way to learn about it is to, is to be given a kind of menu of things that, that is transmitted to you for, like teacher to student mm. and I really really like deeply believe it's the for, it's the you need a, a live context or you need some points of reference to, to re- reality obviously you're going to need some information put into that too it's mm. not just as simple as like there you go everybody off you go do your own thing and reflect on it mm. which is the two way the other too far the other way but so just prime example there's someone who as a spoken word artist was given a quite a sort of dubious opportunity like to they they were going to be commissioned by mm. and um and they had a, a whole load of um contractual obligations and suddenly from being a student that wasn't really interested in that side of things they they totally lit them up to, yeah to be like actually well, hang on what they want that and they want me to do x y and z and i don't own what i make and yeah all those things suddenly you're like oh now you're interested <laughs> yeah or with me with record stuff it's like oh so so the label keeps everything and we have mechanical ro- royalties and we split eight percent of them between however many of us have made this thing yeah suddenly i'm not feeling so kind of good, good about, it, about yeah. everything yeah um, and it's amazing what you learn in that environment mm. and you can do that really quickly mm. so you don't need to go and study for a degree to get that but if you are going to give yourself the space to study for a degree you want the stuff you're learning to be like useful that's what all the <coughs> that's what that's what well this is a thing this is probably worth talking about too but the 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 useful or not useful that it there's a there's a pressure cooker now where f- you've paid fees. Well, that's what I was. Yeah, yeah that's what I was going to say. Because yeah. it's it's, consu- it's a consumer product now. Mm. So it's like I'm paying for this. I want it to deliver deliver what I'm paying for. Yeah, and that's really damaging to a, to an environment of learning. It can be. Um, it also means that students students are kind of able. I mean, it's a difficult one. It's a double edged sword. It's like I imagine a lot of ineffectual, or ineffective, bad teaching has gone on in the past when there hasn't been that a student hasn't been able to say hang on this isn't going anywhere yeah but the other side of that is is even more damaging i think if a student says hang on i've i'm essentially paying to be here mm. and there's a really nasty side to that. it's like i'm effectively paying you mm. 
to be teaching me something that's useful to me now yeah and if <laughs> and, i don't like what you're saying i want to see your manager <laughs> yeah and like this thing that you've critiqued has got like three thousand likes on instagram mm. so people like it already who are you to say it's not yeah not not a... what do you know over those three thousand people go. yeah and then and it's a hard question to it answer it's a that. really hard question to answer it's like a nuanced <laughs> yeah um so so yeah just getting into it, you just realize that the, the teaching environment is something that I'm still really into, passionate about and learning about. Mm. And it, but it's becoming increasingly more complex. And I just really feel and empathize with the, with, with people in there in a kind of student role because it's really complicated mm. for them even more so. And it's quite, kind of quite important to, to fall back on, on on or to reflect on what I was like as a teenager and the confusions I had mm. that's so important um because yeah because the, the world is really complex at the moment and the and the outcomes are not guaranteed in any way and it's a really hard sell to say to people you know you know you're going to invest all of this money and time there is no guarantee that this is going to lead somewhere but I hope these are some tools is there any scholarship element to it? Well, are you trying to reach, you know, vulnerable communities or whatever communities? Yeah, there is, and I haven't, I haven't been privy to exactly what those arrangements are at the right. Um, but I do know that a lot of the there, there are a substantial amount of people who are getting support, but there are also people that are struggling with with real life issues that that are causing them to not complete the the course. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they, they've got on the one hand they've got things right in that they are, yeah, it's sort of improving access, I suppose would be the terminology, um, and they are covering and helping people with that with that with that barrier. Mm. Um, so yeah, so that yes, it is it is doing what it says in mm. that in that way. Um, there are still more subtle ways that it's not the access is not there um and subtle well you know that just in the history of the conservatoire the history of and the history of ed, that sort of education mm. and representation and kind of difficult areas like that where the, where it is a it's a it's a live arena mm -hmm. where things are changing so much that there really does have to be a kind of sensitive and like intelligent balance between imposition of a canon or of a, of learning material and a listening to what's coming back. Um, I'm not. It's probably apparent. I'm not clear on this yet myself. You, uh, like you're it's... also coming into academia at, at a fairly strange time because if you've mm. not really been there long enough, like I'm sure you've talked to other academics that. I like the amount of admin now is ridiculous. The mm. amount of time that you're not spending with students, not spending on lessons and that you're just, you know, filling in forms and completing paperwork for things. Yeah. Yeah. I've certainly seen that in action. Yeah. That's what I've spent my day doing today. Up admin. To now. See, yeah. useful. Yeah. Admin yeah. And, and kind of um, assessment criteria or saying exactly what something is. Mm. You know, there's a lot of that that goes on. And really that goes against what I we was saying earlier, the, the kind of philosophy of like experiential learning, but 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 deep, deep, Dewey-like, deep-rooted research, committed experiential learning. Mm. That doesn't translate very well to like forms that you have to fill in and say exactly what's going to happen. It's so. always going to be a balancing act, isn't it? Because mm. you, you, you're trying to please a lot of constituencies because you've got people who, you know, they're buying an education as a product. Mm. You've got the needs to deliver something because to them as well you know they want they want access to the equipment mm -hmm. that that they would have at university they want access to the the networking mm -hmm. they want access uh to to the knowledge i suppose and the training um i forgot where i was going with this but it was it, basically they're they're buying certain things oh yeah so they're, they're buying a degree brand as well aren't they, they yeah. you know it's like okay so i'm getting all the stuff in the area that i'm interested in and i also get 
brand degree as well so i'm Definitely, now you yeah. know I've, I've ticked off that boxes so it's mm. it's a shorthand way of going right well i've done my artistic thing and i've done something in academic as well yeah it's... yeah and there is an element of that and it's kind of it's difficult to talk without big sweeping generalizations but there are there are kids coming through young people coming through who are there in a way to kind of like you say get the get the name get the degree title mm. and really they they're not they're not synthesizing or melding exactly what they're doing outside or in the real world context with mm. what they're doing in in the in the institution and i think if the course was running in its purest form it would be a, it would be a conversation both ways mm. um and it does work like that sometimes there've been some real successes but there is an element there are still some people who are in there and it, you sense a family pressure somewhere in the background or an expectation, mm. whether it be first generation university kind of study Yeah, yeah, first person to or, go in. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's a very real thing. It's like, um, it's understandable. And some people would probably wouldn't be there without that mm. pressure. Um, so, yeah, um, it's quite, it's really complex. And this, it's... Um, It's opening up almost opening up Pandora's box of like possibilities. Mm. A slightly like shifting point here, but the whole the whole the whole the whole thing is an opening up of access of of potential and possibility. And it's not necessarily um the institutional world isn't that good at keeping up with that. Or what my narrow little kind of back by backwater mm. of it has struggled with that a little bit, um, like what to insist upon, how much to listen, which which fights to fight, yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. um, you you know I suppose in a and in so how long have you been how long have you been in academia as a as an employee then? So five. This is the fifth year. Really, five years already. Yeah. So it's you know I'm new to it and yeah. I had a I had a brief I did a bachelor's I did you know I had three years of being in a university yeah. in the late nineties yeah um, and then a lot of time of just kind of in the field I guess mm. um, and so it has been a crash course it's it's been it's been very very interesting and a big learning experience but it's also been like frustrating difficult yeah. as well. Um, and I can't help thinking that something that didn't have the academic brand could do the job, but did have the resources, could do the yeah. job incredibly well, much yeah. better. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it sounds like it. It sounds like it's something that doesn't really fit a degree, and it'd be something that'd be mm. a much better vocational qualification. Mm. And you know, it'd be the sort of thing. So, on the enterprise stuff, if you're telling people how to kind of monetize their work. How do they do that? Is there a, a business selection model? Is there a like a, or, or is it just are they trying to embed it in each module or how are they? Yeah, that's that's been a problem. Um, and I don't know if even after five years, I'm kind of getting, I'm very comfortable with saying what I don't know because there's a lot that is still being tested. Mm. But I would say that the enterprise, the enterprise that um, the people that designed the course had in mind was an idealized form of helping to, to develop graduates that were ready for entry into an arts industry, whatever that means, right? That's obviously, that's quite difficult. Mm. But it's really like, that is a pie and, you know, it's, it's idealism, isn't it? It's like... Well, it's, it's it's suits, isn't it? It's the money people, yeah. the producers, the, the, mm. the people, the intermediaries between the bankers and the artists. Yes, exactly. Essentially. Quite, yeah, exactly that. Um, and in reality, enterprise is more about the nuts and bolts. It's about, on the one hand, it's about whatever your resource is, making something, making it happen. Mm -hmm. There is an ent you know, the, that sort of enterprising element. Yeah. Then there's also the kind of um, involving collaborative partners and producers and the kind of nuts and bolts of something. So whether that's fulfilling a commission or or um or putting something on entirely on, on your own back um that there's an enterprise in there and then there's also the kind of just the business 
basic business skills stuff. Um, and I would say the course has started off great guns teaching everything. Mm-hmm. and then swiftly realized it couldn't really do all things for all people yeah and has now re- retreated to a position really of it's bespoke it is um and that is probably why the course is not going to have a long-term future because it is the, the, the ideal they've they've kind of they've seen this thing roll over a few times and realized that um the bespoke approach is the best one and is just too resource heavy complicated for for an institution to take on okay so you'll yeah. be launching your own skillshare channel soon then yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> writing down all my lectures these will yeah. go on to skillshare yeah so um let's go back a bit before so you've mm. been in academia for five years you've obviously been working or within the workforce um for more than five years mm. So uh, how did you get into that role and what were you doing before that? Yeah, so um, I've had a lot of different jobs. Um, the thing that got me at, into the was was the was writing and specifically specifically writing lyrics or, or collaborating with musicians. Um, and so did they approach you or you, you went to them with an idea or? I tended to get approached actually. Um, yeah, cause, um, yeah, I've generally been asked to be involved. Mm. So that's actually, that's quite interesting to say out loud. I've not really thought of that before, but um, it would have stemmed from, I guess going all the way back to the beginning was a student show and being approached by, by the kind of like, um, defining in some ways a defining kind of creative relationship in my life mm. so i now have this like prefix of like collaborator <laughs> <laughs> could be much worse i know it's not bad it? <laughs> one, but... of, one of the most famous and successful musicians in the country <laughs> yeah but um it reminds me every time that that's where it started <laughs> but um yeah so i guess the first work i did that would have been publicly known about it's still, it still only got released a decade after I actually met him. Mm. And I did a lot of work in, in the interim, but his name was always in and around. And people mm. would, on the grapevine, say, oh, you're working with him. Would you like to try this? Mm. Um, so I didn't, I really kind of, um, up until now, have um, have tended to collaborate before I've like actualized my own visions, mm. which is interesting. Mm. Um so, so that was people coming to you and asking you to work on something, yeah. Rather they, than you're like, I've got this brilliant new idea and I need ten people. Yes, right, totally, yeah. very much so. Um, and the 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 kind of my my the the individual enterprise from my point of view, I guess, was to actually be writing poetically with vague projects in mind and mm-hmm. practicing those skills to the point that an opportunity arose and I was able to fly with it, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, it's kind of, um, it's been very much a case of having the, having the skills or the attributes and then, and then an opportunity arriving and then jumping into it. Mm. Um, So yeah. And within that, there have been collaborative relationships, but they've generally, it hasn't been me totally delivering someone else's vision there has been a conversation that's then gone on um but i have been i think really as a part of like being acutely aware when i was younger that i wanted to gather experience and gather knowledge before i spoke Mm. i've had this quite profoundly like i was very quiet as a teenager Mm. and listened a lot and always had an idea that i didn't really want to say anything until i'd heard everything Mm -hmm. um and I think that translates into my artistic life or writing. You want to be an authority. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's probably that. Probably I'm too frightened to try anything until I'm sure. <laughs> I am now certain about this and I will tell you how it works. Yeah, I'll give you, I'll just reflect back, <laughs> bravely reflect No, but back. I think it's mm. a word, it's, I think it's a good position, you know. Mm. Like, you know, don't, don't act, think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the world currently probably needs more people that, 
the. It needs some of those people thing. that have been thinking to get off their bums and act. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And it needs some of the people that have been acting to sit down and have a think. Exactly. <laughs> Suck on a strip, so and stop, stop talking for a while. <laughs> have a Rennie and sit down. <laughs> um, so yeah, that that was the that was the 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 main job in loads of different um, loads of different kind of iterations like writing poetry turned into collaborating with musicians but then turned into like dramaturgy work with a contemporary dance company or like mm. there were lots of sort of um different avenues it went down um so quite shapeshiftery and you spent quite a bit of time in london yeah i moved to london straight from uni yeah and stayed and you were there through a lot of the sort of all the spoken word people coming through there you know, it was kind of like a group, a, a cohort of people, wasn't it? That kind of got Kate Tempest and yeah, uh, Polar Bear and Beans on Toast and people like that that sort of come. They all kind of kind of knew each other and yeah, there was definitely that going on. Um, and I probably arrived in London before that started developing, yeah, yeah. Or, or before it had any confidence anyway. Um, but that happened while I was there, certainly. Yeah. yeah. So Kate Tempest would have started rapping at real deal or whatever the record shop carnaby street way and then i didn't really um so you would have you would have been ahead of them were you doing yeah, think... were you doing performance poetry then at no, the time well no this is it i was i wasn't really i was i was too terrified i was i was in i was making music really i was hiding behind like i was in a studio really yeah or in people's bedrooms yeah like um yeah, making things or putting words into other people's mouths, so I yeah. could just be terrified and go and sit somewhere, but but still enjoy them <laughs> happening. Um, whereas Kate Tempest, I don't think was terrified. I think she was like kind of I, well, well, probably both. She was probably yeah. terrified and fearless. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the famous thing about her, I was, footage of her at a festival, just getting up and rapping at what, like a hero. I yeah. can't remember who it was. It was a big, big, uh, big dog in the in the world of the hip-hop world and yeah little girl sort of got up and spat some bars at him yeah and he was quite nice to her (laughs) but no she's been she's been um yeah it was around that time so i'm digressing totally but she was she's she's an incredibly good example of someone who's had some skills and is in really like tenacious self-promoter and has tied herself to the right people Mm. and developed and done it in the kind of public eye and has got to a point now where she's brilliant and i wouldn't have said she was brilliant necessarily then or even at points in the interim i think Mm -hmm. she's reached a point where she's she has understood what she's doing yeah and it's good. Yeah. It's like you've got your voice, but you also know what you are, what your. It's like finding your voice, but mm. also finding out what your product is. Yeah. It's like obvious to say, well, you were a, a singer or a vocalist. It's like, well, your voice is obviously the thing. It's like, but it's not just that. Mm. It's like my voice comes with certain. Um, what's the word that I'm looking for? But there are certain emotional. Clothing that you hang on that peg. That's a terrible metaphor. No, I get you though. You know, it's right. It's right. Yeah. So it's, it's understanding your offer, maybe, or understanding your. Um, yeah, well, not- it's like, like Michael Jackson. Is like Michael Jackson is fingerless glove. You know, uh, the hat, the moonwalk. It's not just oh, it's the Michael Jackson song. It's like everything about the image and why they worry about the image, but it's also what you're talking about, like the, the kind of subjects that you cover and yeah. Yeah. yeah and that takes a lot of getting it wrong and a lot of trying and you have and, to, yeah. and you have to build it for like you, mm. you can't come in with that it's like a little it's like a castle that you build isn't it it's mm. like or or with an actor of the roles that you're in people get used to you playing certain things in certain ways that they buy you in yeah it's like you're building I suppose you're building a paras- parasocial relationship with your audience to some degree yeah it's probably not parasocial but no, I hear that. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that that's been an interesting trajectory to watch, really. And I was never never directly involved with her or any of the other names you mentioned, really, because I was sort of on a different, yeah, like yeah. a parallel yeah. road along across London. Yeah, they were on Euston Road, and I was going through the middle of town somewhere. <laughs> or like, or, like, but um, but I did I did meet up with that lot when 
there was a commission to put poems in the London Underground. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, again, was nearly brilliant. Mm. It's just a shame they were on the wrong screens. I, when they asked me to do it, I thought they were on the screens going up the es- uh, escalators. Yeah, yeah. So I was so excited by that. I thought, I've got this idea that will really smash that. And then I found out after I'd done the idea that they were just going to be on one screen yeah. like going across the tracks. <laughs> um, but for the launch party of that, Smile for London, it was called, I was on the same bill as all that lot. Mm. And so I thought, you know what? Fuck it. I'll, I'll do one. I'll get up there. And I did something. Brave it. Yeah, I did it. And it was all right. I, yeah. I do like it. Yeah. But it's not my, it's not my thing. And there was, Inua Ellums was, was doing it and Francesca Beard and a few people that I've like, their, it's their thing. They are mm. really, they're really good at good at it. Mm. Um, and Murray Lachlan Young, and that you know. So I saw what that what that world was like. Mm. Um, and just I tell you what springs to mind thinking about that. That afterwards, the drinks afterwards, I thought there were a lot of people in that room who had a kind of level of material support. It has to be said. The, the, there was a level of material support underlying the people that were in that room. Mm. So people that are prominent, they yes, they're talented, but they are people that have been able to have the time and space to to develop their thing. Yeah, that's really worth and saying. and have the backing. Yeah, it, it's not it, it it's not just the individual or the individual being clever and using what assets they have around them. It's getting the encouragement. It's mm-hmm. having someone behind you and someone that's like. You should really do it. Yeah, you know, from from that to the financial support. But if you've got the if you've got the money and no one's bothered, mm. you know, yeah, like I don't, I I don't think you'll ever really do anything totally for yourself. Yeah, I think that's true. And then it just struck me that night there were people, there were there were there were consummate networkers in that room, and there were people that have gone on to like an author who I, I definitely don't want to like say things about people that I don't know, but the I think the guy that did collection of kind of stories, mm. um, which is brilliant, was was from a kind of a public school background. Mm. The same way that, that um, there were quite a few people that were there that were from a kind of affluent background mm-hmm. who've gone on to have a a career and be recognised. And it's not just about going to private school or not. It's not just that. It's like everybody had a certain. There was a sense of a certain level of like comfort mm. in the room. Um, and I don't know, that stuck with me. The biggest thing from that whole experience that stuck with me. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, well, I mean, it's the UK is one of the worst for social mobility in the OECD. So, you know, and you, you're going to have to have the connections since like, even if you are poor, you're going to need to have one of your mates know someone who knows. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Cause you need the introduction. No, you're right. Yeah. It's not like, you know, BBC talent scouts are going down the local working men's club and going, what fresh working class <laughs> talent can we, what gem stone from the rough can we find here? It's yeah. like, and, and more often than not, it's kind of people who are posh trying to get working class credit. in it? Yeah. Like, you know, oh, oh well, I had to live in this hovel. It's like well, you didn't have to. You, mm. you you did, and you went to art school to kind of prove that you know you're not a complete toff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's a level of like the <coughs> the move to the big city. Um, yeah, from the country. <laughs> yeah, but then there's also like whatever your whatever background you've come from, there is a. I've sort of talked about this before without really investigating it, but this idea of like. London infrastructure wise, there's there's a lot there, there's a lot happening. And if you can jump on the coattails or like or survive, mm. then you do get access immediately mm. to a lot of opportunities. Mm. So it is possible in that sense, that kind of rags to riches like stuff. Um but it's also I think there are a lot of people who, who move move there and live what is in inverted commas a hard life or not monetized or they are struggling mm. but they're not really struggling mm. in the sense that there there are you could go home there are fundamental yeah <laughs> there are safety nets of some sort or other yeah um you know george orwell style and people can struggle yeah and will struggle and will yeah and i'm i'm not sort of saying they don't but there is definitely an element where the you know where you can if go. you're really fucking struggling you're not yeah. you're not generally making yeah where you just say, look, yeah, I have to pretend, I have to stop pretending to be a bohemian artist and 
go home and work in the insurance company. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so hey ho. Um, yeah, how did we get onto that smile for London? Uh, just going work. back, and I was just saying, yeah. you know, you were you were doing this sort of poetry at the, the same time, I'm but coming in a bit earlier. Yeah, it's yeah maybe worth saying a bit about that. So the the safety net or the money like to I I didn't survive from 2001 to 2010 on purely on on freelance artworks I just didn't so I had um I had various various things that 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 kept things going like a kind of a research job at a um at a community voluntary sector kind of consultancy and I had a, a live-in caring job that I did for a while. Mm. I did a bit of welfare to work advice. So I was a, that, the guy in the tie at the job centre. You know, so you were you were basically bumming around, and then you were employed to tell people how to get jobs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I had a year of that, um, meeting brilliant people, but also that was like private sector led sort of yeah. new deal. I can't remember what it was called at the time, but it was essentially all that like welfare yeah. to work, bullying people back to work. Yeah. But I just w- wouldn't buy into and, that. And the statistics were that, that people on those schemes actually perform worse than people finding work for themselves. Yeah, so they would go on to work because they were being bullied into it. And so their person, their advisor would get their 28 grand a year and the company would get all of its money, but then they'd fall out of work again because mm. essentially they'd been pushed in something that wasn't yeah, for them. sustainable. Mm. But yeah, that's a nice little the, the, that policy and a like microcosm, isn't it? Like, um, <laughs> but I had a great time in a way, a hellish time <laughs> for a year. But I met the I met some truly memorable people coming through in the kind of mm. client sense and uh, somehow left a year of it as like the top performing con man <laughs> out of all of the different con people that were in there doing it. Well, you were probably actually giving people useful advice. Yeah, like, no. I what was... are you already doing? Okay, yeah. well, you know what you're doing. What have you tried this thing as well? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the tendency is to talk to everyone like they're a five year old idiot and go. This is how you write a CV. Put your name yeah, at the top. Yeah. Hello, I'm straight out of Nottingham University. Do you know how to write a CV? <laughs> Let me tell you. Tell me about you, and I'll turn it into a cracking CV. <laughs> I printed right. this thing out of <laughs> off of the internet last night. Let me read it to you. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> you can't Google, yeah. can you? Yeah. Uh, how old are you? Forty-eight. That's nice. I'm twenty-two. Let me t- let me tell you a few things. <laughs> you know, the workplace has changed. It's very different yes. from your day. <laughs> I was working last week. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, it's funny anyway, times. All yeah, all um, all interesting stuff. Yeah, <laughs> um, and le- yeah, earning enough money to to keep things ticking over. Keep yourself alive. Yes. And dry and free drunk, from trench foot. Drunk, yeah. really. Well, in drunk, yeah. London years. That generally yeah. coast you through <laughs> the trauma of... <laughs> <laughs> you wake up sometime in your 30s and go, oh, yeah. God. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think I better leave London now. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, at least you got out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But while it's you're there, easy you, thing you to bump do. into Rory Bremner or... Uh, <laughs> Hugh Stevens or uh, or Fiona Newsreader Bruce Bruce or you know things like that happen. <laughs> That's true, <laughs> which is important. But yeah. it makes you feel it, when you're there. It makes you feel pretty special. Like, you do. You do feel like you are somewhere that matters when you're in London. Yeah, like you know, it feels like you're. Even if you're not doing anything particularly important, it feels like your opinion matters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. When, if you see the news, you'd be like, "I live there," <laughs> pretty much all the time. Mostly, yeah. yeah. Um, well, there, there, there isn't anything outside London. No, um, <laughs> we're we're not actually anywhere. We're just no, we don't exist. No, no, no. The, yeah, the, the map runs out. There's a train <laughs> line, isn't there? Anything yeah. outside the M25 doesn't yeah. exist. Um, London's awesome as well, though. It is. It is like the 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 same thing that makes it that kind of bubble is a huge strength. Mm. The fact you know it is representative of almost every nation on the planet in some way. Mm. There are 
it is an experiment that isn't replicated in many other places in the world mm. currently in terms of the level of that kind of integration is the wrong word it's come it's too loaded isn't it but mm. like that, that sort of like living alongside fellow human beings there isn't another every, city every in type. the country even in europe that's like it no so that is that is a i mean it is an incredible energy i love going back there mm. i love it um and i miss the london i remember i just miss the london i remember <laughs> there you go again it's like you sort of own it don't you when you're there you do I, you I, do I own this place. well uh, my my theory is um you know you've been anywhere seven years you're supposed to replace all your your souls in your body after that's seven right years. yeah You've been somewhere seven years. You're from there. Yeah. In that case, so, I'm from London. Yeah. 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 Part of you is. Part of you always will be. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm reading a book at the moment about the, the mud larking that goes on. The like tidal river. All right. Yeah. So every time it drops down, and because of all the kind of rummaging around that's gone on, new treasures from the thousands of years that we've lived around that area have thrown up. Right. And I love that idea. That there's always, you know, things are just being sifted, and every time you can get yeah, down yeah. on that little foreshore and find something from yeah hundreds of years ago or millions. Yeah, but don't get me started on that. I'm be <laughs> very bored. Okay, so yeah. uh, I'll I'll start to wrap it up. But okay. what I want to go on to, so I'll say this we'll just while we're here and we're chatting. So when I've been listening back to these, um, they are quite they are quite interesting. I thought I thought there'd be certain sections of like. Oh, this will be, you know, that'll be boring chatter, and then yeah. this will be something exciting that I listen to. But most of the stuff that I thought would be boring chatter is actually the interesting stuff. And I thought the things that were like these are going to be the exciting hot takes. It's like, uh, and then plus I have to interject. So the the worst part about listening back is hearing all the waffle from me. It's just what is he going on about? Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> you always get that you. when you listen back to stuff. <laughs> I get that. Yeah, anything that's ever been filmed, where I've been talking, I've been like, people have asked me really interesting questions, or an interviewer has, and I've just talked, taken the agenda and gone, oh, I can't freestyle on that. I'll just say the thing that I was going to say anyway. For oh, fuck's sake! <laughs> <laughs> Other people yeah. find it interesting because they don't know what you're going to say. Yeah. And you're just critiquing yourself generally. Mm. I, I mean, I'm not saying that's the case with my waffling because I do talk a lot of shit. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so I, I want to kind of cover the future of work. Yeah. So in a, you know, UBI, universal basic income, universal basic services, fully automated communism, or, you know, non-stop Amazon dystopian <laughs> death fascism, <laughs> little barcodes on everyone. Like, where, where, where do you see work going in the future? Yeah, it's such a good question. It's just a key question. Uh, it's what I seem to come back to whenever I have time to think. Well, we'll drop it in since it's, you know, it's around election time. So yeah. we've got a Corbyn proposal, well, not Corbyn assessment, but in a journalistic speak, but the Labour Party with their four day week, so 32 hour week. Mm. Um, I mean, do you think that's the way forward of like reducing hours? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's a really sensible idea, full full stop. Yeah, I do. I mean, just on a purely on a like how long are human beings um, typically productive for? And like, productive is a loaded word there as well, but just like how long can a human being actually kind of do do useful things for? genuinely useful using kind of creative energy and like high skill yeah yeah and i think that is about the right sort of thing and it wouldn't necessarily be four days for me it might be it might be seven days but just a lot shorter time mm. or like you know like three hours worth that doesn't the math doesn't work there i realize <laughs> but like i do feel like that there's there's something there that is just on a practical level solely is 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 right yeah like people are going to be more productive and i think he's being ridiculed for that but like why I've got no idea. People are going to be more productive in that time. It's not a case of it's... time versus um, money. Now it doesn't feel like that. Those links have just been eroded to the point that it's it's not even there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a very weird thing. It's, it's it's all based on you know. I think for me, a lot of that media profile is that they've got. It's like the thing of. Everybody knows what normal is, but nobody thinks they're it. Of the the press have they have their imagined Britain, you know. They have their imagined guy on the number forty seven bus or whatever mm. it is, and you know, Mondeo man or whatever rubbish they make up. 
But in their heads, it's like, no, all we care about is, you know, working our fingers to our bones <laughs> day to night. Mm. And, and that's it. And hard work, sweat of the brow, and that's good enough. And it's like, that's not how anyone in the country actually thinks. Mm. You know, yeah. it, it's it, it's not replicated anyway. I mean, there's a lot of, there are a lot of people, you know, I've, I've worked with workaholics and people that won't stop but they're not you know they're, they're, uh, most of them don't think that everyone should work until their hands bleed yeah <laughs> well it's like there's a new so this that that book i was just talking about the mudlarking book there, there are times where this this lady's gone down and found what were like substitute monies at various times like mm. in the 1600s where mm -hmm. publicans would give you a little kind of button that you could is this a sort of idea? We are still very much tied to the idea of toil, money, these sorts of, and they are just concepts, aren't they? Mm. And then, and it's it's without a doubt time for the next shift. You know, new forms of worth, rather not wealth, even just like new forms of distinguishing. I don't even know the terminology. I'm trying to say. Okay, well, yes, yeah. I think we should go here. So. Um... So, you know, Jaron Lanier, mm -hmm. uh, the technologist, so he did a recent little video. I don't know if I sent you it, but um, it's very good. It's building on his talks where he was basically saying we should pay for the internet. Mm. And he's expanding that and saying, you need to get paid for your data, mm. um, which I am absolutely 100%. It's like, you know, data doesn't exist before we create it. You know, we make it and it's at the point of contact. Um and none of the AI stuff can work without our data and all the masses of data and all of those profits, you know, and all the advertising and micro clicks, that's money that's been made off us, off mm. work that we're creating for free. Mm. And, and the fact that they're, they're sort of like, oh no, you can't have, you know, the fact that there's any resistance at all to universal basic, basic income on that, on that premise, it's just totally obnoxious yeah, for yeah. a start. Um, but yeah, he's he's like you would get royalties for it. There would be ways of of organizing it. It's a it's a very. I'll send you the video. It's very mm. good. Um, but I think that kind of thing where the society is told, you know, you're all contributing. You know, you're all we're all creating this wealth. Mm. You know, it's like the thing of the, you know, the meeting room, the big big bankers meeting room or whatever. So. Like, well, you couldn't have that million dollar meeting if you didn't have a cleaner who came in and made the room sparkly and clean, mm. you know. No, you're not going to close that deal in a skanky, you know, dirt filled hell hole. <laughs> yeah. So there's, some, there's something there. <coughs> I totally agree with all of that. Um, and this sort of need to counter the just the siphoning and it's the just ridiculous and ludicrous levels that it's getting to now of the, of the kind of the the top of those pyramids or the, the, the where where all of the resource floods to. Yeah. And the music industry felt it very much with streaming and, and um and the you know, people can have a million streams of a song yeah. and not make any money from it. Yeah. Essentially, like the artist. But the thing so yeah, there's a lot there's thinking to be done around that. Universal basic income has to be a good idea. But then the thing that runs alongside it is this kind of like social currency for me. It's like um almost like a bartering economy back to it or a, or a sharing economy a skill sharing in a local or community sense and like we're having seen a few places around the world there are there are definitely places where that exists more than others so new zealand struck me when i was there as a good example of that if somebody has a pig and they butcher the pig and they'll share cuts of the pig with somebody mm. else who has a on that sort of level or they will make an engine that they have in their car run mm through sharing knowledge and understanding mm. and, and just like keeping things going like patching them up and where there, there's something about that that is like um especially with the the climate crisis as it exists and this idea of just getting back to not getting bigger and better all of the time and not obsessing about wealth money as wealth but seeing wealth as skills and links um I think I think there was quite a number done on us, mm. like well, especially for myself, as you look back at um, 
especially all the you know the Thatcherite, Reaganite deregulation and all the the uh, like the the toys and stuff that we're all nostalgic about and going mad for. If I we were programmed by television, you know, we're not, our parents are told to leave us in front of the TV. The TV tells us to buy all of these things, and we nag our parents to buy the things, and we train them into like only buy brands, throw everything away. You don't need it, you know. We were the ones that that created a lot of this mentality, my generation, mm. at least. That you know, that's the way that I see it. Um, where was I going with this? Yeah, and 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 a lot of that alienation and atomization is, is already built into that. Is assumed. I remember when I when I got my first house, it was almost a point of pride that I didn't answer. The, you know, if anyone knocked on the door, I wouldn't answer the door. It's like. Well, I'm not going to, it's my own house. I don't need to answer the door and I'm not going to hide from them or anything. I'm just ignore them. And like, mm. But why? I mean, most of the time, because there's someone who wants something, but you know, how are you going to meet your neighbors or be neighborly or make new contacts or anything like that? Mm. Um, without, without that kind of interaction, you know, like how I, I should be more, engaged in in various social networks in my community just naturally mm. but i think i'm not because i'm sort of like well other people you know and dealing with the social aspects of it but the rewards are really great mm. but you you have to make that effort and in my mind it's this the whole sort of bothering someone no one wants to be bothered i don't want to be bothered yeah leave me alone and everyone that's deeply ingrained in us isn't it? this idea that we have to be self-sufficient beings on some level well completely yeah. autonomous and that you shouldn't be you know don't disturb don't disturb that yeah. man or that lady yeah. or um, you know. and it get exactly and it gets to chronic it gets to illness levels where people are lonely yeah and sitting next to people on the bus and and feeling too anxious to say anything yeah and then i think everybody feels that on on some level but there, there is a the 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 um, optimistic or the hopeful counter to that, which does sound like kind of crying in the dark a little bit, but is genuinely optimistic. I think is an idea that that is flourishing again, and people are starting to to think of or realize that they're that we're not we're not we're we're animals that that are meant to be in communities, and mm-hmm. we're, and we are um, that's where our value lies. Well, it, even mm. within cities, I think, I think you know, exactly right. But I think within cities that we we developed this, and part of it is, part of it is it is like in political control through fear and 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 fear of the other, and to be self contained, and you can only meet people in nice, expensive coffee houses mm. or somewhere somewhere where you'll spend money. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it is at that level. It's like, don't yeah. go meet someone in the library. Come to a nice, you know, mm. sit down with your sourdough bread and you make it yourself <laughs> a sandwich kit or whatever. And uh, yeah, don't d- only speak to people within these these certain circumstances. I was going to say something else then. Um, I can't remember. This is normally at the point no, where I start to wind it. You know, that's <laughs> yeah, fine. Go on, go on. But that is that is a, definitely a thing. It's this sort of the control is so pervasive um the, the the very idea of what is a public space or what is an area that you're allowed to commune with people mm. has been affected and like you say mm. it's like if you want to socialize you have you feel a need to go to a coffee shop or you, mm. want, you don't you don't necessarily go and sit on a bench in the middle of town yeah because that has a connotation you know you only go there if you're down and out or you go there if you know, or even like, even joining a book club or a knitting mm, circle or something like that. There's like yeah, less, there's less generally the yeah. assumption is it's like you'll see it with older generations of like we'll put on tea and coffee and there'll be some fairy cakes that someone's made. You mm. know, like a, a WI meeting or something where like people make the jam and you turn up. But most of the other things is like oh well we're going to hold this meeting. It's going to be in this bar or in this restaurant. Which uh, there's a tacit assumption of like you have to buy something. Yeah, you know, even if it's just a coffee or you know, have a glass of water. But it, it's always sort of, if you're not spending money, you're not doing anything important. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that is so, that is really pervasive, isn't mm. it? Um, and worth kind of like critiquing, like kind of becoming aware of and like actively resisting. Simon here to sign off. 
Firstly, value extraction, please, please, please like, share and subscribe to the podcast, however you're listening. Uh, the more you support, the more I can get done. I've said please three times, so you have to do it now. Also, change, please. Show me some cash on Kofi and there's a Patreon also up and running. Details will be on the website. I don't have a proper WordPress uh, domain website address at the moment, so you can find the website link in the show notes to be on the show either anonymously or if you want to promote yourself or your work please get in touch via twitter Uh, twitter handle is at western studios 2 and you can dm me there it also has the website link shown in the profile Uh, that's it for now new episodes will drop as soon as possible hope everyone stays safe and calm and looks after each other and um yeah best of luck to all of us